and shall be deep with someone nice as you. D is for everybody, darling. Have no doubt that it's and welcome to another episode of the VD Clinic. It is another anti-holiday holiday episode. <laughs> There's gifts. There are gifts. And we did leave this as a surprise, although we did leave a little clue. Hmm. A couple did clues. Did we hear? Yes. At least one clue. Um, I am Vanessa, and with me, as always, is Darren. Say hello, Darren. Hello. Yes, and we have some guests today, and yeah, we are doing the movie Clue. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've got Court from uh, Cinema Psyops. Say hello, Court. Hello, Court. Okay. I, I just did what you told me to do. Yeah I, yeah, I figured something like that was coming. <laughs> I am the eternal smartass. Yes. And then we have the infamous witch. <laughs> uh, hi, hi. Of, of multiple podcasts. <laughs> In, indeed. I, I, I am a podcast gadabout, one might say. Yes, yes. Thank you. We Well, we've had you both on before, like in the past, separately. Um, and it's been a while. And the holidays are always more fun when you have people to share time with you. Yes. So thank you for being here. And like I said, we're doing the movie Clue. We've got uh, a little surprise. And I guess we've kind of, Darren, have we, we've teased this before that we were going to do this maybe. Or we left it cryptically enough that we didn't really explain ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think we were pretty. Uh, what, what do you mean about what we're going to do for the episode or what we're getting ready to do very shortly here? We're, get, we're getting ready to do very shortly here. Yes, we've been a little less obvious about that. Okay, yeah. It, we've hinted at it. We've said we were going to have a special surprise for you. Um, and this is a surprise. So um, before we come back with that and then get into talking about the movie, is the, anybody want to share what's been going on that's keeping them sane and Corona times are just <laughs> everybody's sick of talking about that. Uh, for the holiday season, I'm leaning hard into Christmas spirit. I'm watching like the corniest, most sappy Christmas movies I possibly can. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to let my heart grow three sizes too big while I watch them just to go ahead and enjoy them. Cause That's it's like healthy. All right, what the hell else am know. I going to do? <laughs> it is not healthy to let your heart grow three sizes, bro. It'll kill you. <laughs> so what you're saying is I should stop letting my heart do so much uh, uh, exercise and I should try and make it like chill a little bit. Yeah. Chill your heart. Though. <laughs> too much, too fast. You'll get the bends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, or, or you'll have a stroke and, you know. That's been what? that's been my thing is just overindulging in Christmas movies. And then I'm balancing that out by watching things like Happy and then Christmas themed slashers and stuff. Oh. Of course. You are certainly doing something more festive than me. Too much true crime, you know, but that's the story of my life. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I decided to get away from, um, you know, everything that's happening and immerse myself in uh, the dystopian future that is Cyberpunk 2077. So I can happily kill people with diseases and not feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, wa <laughs> I'm waiting for mine to show up. My mother-in-law got it for me for Christmas like two years ago when it was supposed to come out. So I think it uh, is at her house in Indianapolis or hopefully on its way to my house. Cool. It's worth the wait, bro. Definitely worth the wait. I mean, it's got Keanu Reeves in it, right? Yeah, uh, cyberpunk Keanu Reeves is freaking awesome. He's my new spirit animal. Can you make him look like Johnny Mnemonic? That's all I care about. Uh, thank you. You know, one of these days we're going to have to talk about that on this show. <laughs> I think you can pick all of your own genitalia. You can, um, and you can you can be um, any any mix of uh, genitalia or gender you choose, which I think is really cool. Uh, my sixteen year old daughter 
found it immensely amusing to choose penis size. <laughs> Okay, then. <laughs> I guess it's not very Christmassy, but I watched... Well, in a way, it's kind of Christmassy. I watched The Platform, or El Oil, uh, the other day. I don't know if you've seen that. That movie it popped up on Netflix. That, that is a very cool movie. I watched that in a Teapot's Watch Along. Oh, uh, did you? And it was... Yeah, and it, it it's rad. And it, you know what? It is Christmassy, because there's a big feast. Except yep. for everybody at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, that'll be, I'll, I'll mention that again later when I talk about upcoming episodes that are coming out of a different show than this one. Ooh. Um, but yeah, uh, that, I speaking to your true crime, Vanessa, uh, I watched Tickled again. <gasps> that documentary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was that one uh second place in the that podcast is... under the stairs listener thing i know i saw that that is that documentary is one of those that you're just like this is such a very what's the word special case <laughs> yeah. it's just one of those cases where truth is stranger than fiction um, if bad religion is to be believed, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Yep. <laughs> they're 40. Okay. They're 40 this year. Just the band is 40? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. They're all old, older than 40. But the band, I think, is celebrating its 40th year. Oh, Good God, Lord, that band has been around as long as I've been alive almost. Yeah. Oh. Well, if they, yeah. yeah I mean, thanks. 1980, that makes them 40. Yeah, uh, I think there's they are going to be doing some <laughs> live performance Zoom things of like the 80s, the 90s, the aughts to 2010, and I think 2010 to 2020 in four different concerts. Uh, we are not sponsored by Bad Religion, but <laughs> that would be fucking <laughs> rad. But we, but we, we might be fans. going on a bit too much because of our secret guest. <laughs> of our secrets. <laughs> secret guest and on that note we are going to take a brief break and we will be back with an extra special surprise be right back this will keep it quiet oh hi there i didn't see you you caught me cutting a new show i'm bo ransdell and i'm one of the many creators you can find on legion podcasts i said quiet my fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really. You can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon. And for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it. And thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. And now, another episode of Quarantine Theatre. You'll find your names beside your places. Please be seated. Is this place for you? Indeed, no, sir. I'm merely a humble butler. What exactly do you do? I bottle, sir. Which means what? The butler is the head of the kitchen and the dining room. I keep everything tidy. That's all. Well, what's this all about, butler? This dinner party. Ours is not to reason why. Ours is to do and die. Die? Merely quoting, sir, Alfred Lord Tennyson. <clears throat> I prefer Kipling myself. 
The female of the species is more deadly than the male. Do you like Kipling, Miss Scarlet? Sure, I'll eat anything. Shark fin soup, madame. So is this for our host? No, sir. For the seventh guest, Mr. Body. I thought Mr. Body was our host. So did so I. So did I. So who's our host, Mr. Wordsworth? <laughs> I want to start while it's still hot. Oh, now, shouldn't we wait for the other guest? I would keep something warm for him. What did you have in mind, dear? <laughs> well, someone's got to break the ice. It might as well be me. I mean, I'm used to being a hostess. It's part of my husband's work, and... It's always difficult when a group of new friends meet together for the first time to get acquainted. So I'm perfectly prepared to start the ball rolling. I mean, I have absolutely no idea what we're doing here, or what I'm doing here, or what this place is about, but I'm determined to enjoy myself, and I'm very intrigued. And oh my, this soup's delicious, isn't it? You say you used to be a hostess, a part of your husband's work? Yes, it's an integral part of your life when you're the wife of a... Uh, but then I forget, we're not supposed to say who we really are. Although, heavens to Betsy, I don't know why. Don't you? I know who you are. Aren't you going to tell us? How do I know who I am? I work in Washington, too. Washington? So you're a politician's wife? Yes, I... I am. Well, come on, then. Who's your husband? So what does your husband do? Nothing. Nothing? Well, he just lies around on his back all day. <laughs> Sounds like hard work to me. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a little bit accident prone. Oh, <laughs> watch it. excuse moi Oh my, oh, mm, this is one of my favorite recipes. I know, madam. So, what do you do in Washington, D.C., Mr. Green? Come on, what do you do? I mean, how are we to get acquainted if we don't say something about ourselves? Perhaps he doesn't want to get acquainted with you. Well, I'm sure I don't know. But if I wasn't trying to keep the conversation going, then we would just be sitting here in embarrassed silence. Are you afraid of silence, Mrs. Peacock? Yes. What? No. Why? Well, it, it just seems to me that you are. You, you seem to suffer from what we call pressure of speech. We? Who's we? Are you a shrink? I do know a little bit about psychological medicine, yes. Oh, you're a doctor? Uh, I am, but I don't practice. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, huh? <laughs> I think most men need a little practice. Don't you, Mrs. Peacock? Uh... So what do you do, Professor? I work for UNO, the United Nations Organization. Another politician, Jesus! No, I work for a branch of UNO, the WHO, the World Health Organization. Well, what is your area of special concern? Uh, family planning. What about you, Colonel? Are you a real Colonel? I am, sir. You're not going to mention the coincidence that you also live in Washington, D.C.? How do you know that? Have we met before? I've certainly seen you before. Although you may not have seen me. So, Miss Scarlet, do you mean that you live in Washington, too? Sure do. Well, does anyone here not live in Washington, D.C.? I don't. Yes, but you work for United Nations. That's a government job. And the rest of us all live in government towns. Everyone here has earned their living from the government, one way or another. Wadsworth, where's our host and why have we been brought here? Ah, oh, good evening. You are eagerly awaited. Are you locking me in? I'll take the key. Over my dead body, sir. May I take your bag? No, 
I'll leave it here till I need it. It contains evidence, I presume. Surprises, my friend. That's what it contains. Surprises. Dun, dun, dun! Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Mr. Body. What are they all doing here? Eating dinner. Do sit down, Mr. Body. Thanks. Uh, you can take that away, honey. Look! I demand to know what's going on. Now, why have we all been dragged up here to this horrible place? Well, I believe we all received a letter. My letter says it would be to your advantage to be present on this date because Mr. Body will bring to an end a certain long-standing confidential and painful financial liability. It is signed, Offred. I received a similar letter. So did we, didn't we? I also received a letter. No thanks, Yvette. I just ate. Now how do you know her name? We know each other, don't we, dear? Forgive my curiosity, Mr. Body, but did your letter say the same thing? No. I see. Can I interest anyone in fruit or dessert? In that case, may I suggest we adjourn to the study for coffee and brandy, at which point I believe our unknown host will reveal his intentions. Dun, dun, dun! Broadcasting from the Cursed Earth, the psycho Let us face, without panic, the reality of our time. The fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. Just to have a, uh, an ignorant, uh, thin-skinned megalomaniac uh, who sends off uh, you know, on Twitters at 3 a.m. if somebody angered him. The neo-Nazis turning up in Washington, D.C. to have a rally saying, Heil Trump. We talk about politics. I knew I couldn't trust you corporate grease balls. We talk about movies. You can't come down here and arrest people just because of what they look like. Are you crazy? If that's police harassment. We talk about political movies. We're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. They're all around us and we never knew it. You can only see them with these special glasses. The Psycho Semanticast. And we are back after that scene and a wonderful extra special guest. That is uh, Court's better half, Bev. Thank you very much, Bev. We enjoyed you joining us. Um, but now we're going to hear and actually talk about Clue, the 1985 movie based on the board game, which it was the first time that they that had ever been done. And I remember uh, I was gonna, I was going to ask. Uh, all of you when you first saw this but I will say for me um, this is when my parents I guess were just separated or just divorced so I was going on all these movie outings with my dad when I was a kid or early teenager and I saw actually because they released it in theaters with the like three different you know, variations. Um, I saw it twice in the theater <laughs> originally with two different endings. Oh, that's cool. I wasn't oh. sure how they did that. If you had to go a certain distance away or if it was just random. It was random like the day of the week or what movie theater in the city. It, it, it was just kind of random. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was always cable. I'd never seen this until like HBO or whatever is whoever originally aired it first. I think it was HBO. I might have caught it on as a kid, but I watched it a ton. And I always just assumed that all the endings were the same until you learn later on what had actually happened. And I think yeah. I think it might have been like on a late night cable viewing where it was the first time that somebody discussed that, that all those different endings were actually it was different in different theaters, kind of like how they would have the A&E host tell you a bunch of stuff about the movie but i don't right. think clue was ever played on that but it was like some kind of thing that they gave you some kind of fact after the movie while the credits were playing or something that i heard that and i was like really and it was like the first time like as a little kid that i realized that 
there are different versions sometimes for movies on TV than what you would see in a theater or broadcast or, you know, or even on a VHS tape that you rent. And that kind of got me started into being obsessed with the differences of movies and how editing works and all that kind of stuff. Right. And then when you look at this and watch it like multiple viewings, you see different ways, like how like, oh, okay, this leads up to like presenting this different ending as a possibility. I think it was, I mean, I think, I think it was pretty well done. Uh, yeah, you can actually weave the script all the way together. And I think, wasn't there a disc that was a release of this where you could choose individual endings or all the endings or, or whatever, where you could just kind of choose yeah. the way that you wanted it to end. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I think, think that would be they... kind of fun to watch the plot lines develop for that in that, that way too. And I read on IMDb, which who knows how true this is, but that this was actually written with a fourth possible ending. <laughs> so it really, really ended. Ended, right. <laughs> Well, but but what they did when they released it in the theaters is they only released it as, okay, ending one, Miss Scarlet did it. I saw that in the theater first. Then the second uh, variation was Miss Peacock did it. Um, and then the third one was, and it didn't say this is what really happened. It ju It doesn't have that title card. It just goes into where you have each of them like six different murderers and Mr. Green, you know, being the FBI guy. I told you I didn't do it. I told you I didn't <laughs> do it. I know exactly. That's a, a, there's certain lines in this, like that are repeated over and over again. That just crack me up. And that's one of them is I didn't do, I told you I didn't do it. Or, you know, the whole, the whole thing with the double negatives. And I mean, proof positive. I didn't not do it. Yeah. And Tim Curry's ability to make no and yes seem alluring and a come on as well when he's answering questions, just because yeah. he'll give you that that sexy side eye that's just so amazing. Yes. Well, first of all, let's talk about the cast. Um, You have. Well, OK. You have Eileen Brennan. This is an alphabetical order. You have Eileen Brennan and this is Mrs. Peacock. You have Tim Curry as Wadsworth, Malin Khan as Mrs. White, uh, Christopher Lloyd as Pro Professor Plum, um, Michael McKeon as Mr. Green, Martin Mull as Colonel Mustard, and Leslie Ann Warren as Miss Scarlet. You know, the, that core group alone, I mean, you have Colin Camp and Lee Ving in there, too, and a couple, you know, the couple other people, uh, you know, j that end up just getting killed off pretty quickly, relatively speaking, or, or much more minor characters. But that's the core group is the seven of them. And those are some, you know, pretty big acting talents there. You have like four Oscar nominated actors. I mean, that alone and then there's Martin Mull, whose entirety of movie career existed only in the 80s, and then he immediately disappeared from view for a while. To the well, point no, where that became no. a joke for a pizza commercial. <laughs> no, he was doing TV. Because he was on Roseanne for a while. Do you remember that, that pizza commercial I'm talking about, though, where somebody was like, hey, yeah. you kind of look like that guy, Martin Mull. Whatever happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. all i was referencing but yeah he was like um like a landlord or something when they owned the loose meat shop in uh uh roseanne or something right Leon, the gay character yeah one yeah. of the gay characters yeah see first time i saw a clue i thought that he did it because i knew him as the evil boss from mr mom yeah so i, I, I was like that's i think it's him pretty sure unless i just fabricated that memory but i didn't do that on well purpose. and then and then you have okay like eileen brennan always makes me think of, of private benjamin yes very much so that's a fantastic movie with goldie horn yes you know and and I, it's really funny i was watching this and the last like in october 
And this is also the last Tim Curry movie I watched, but it was Rocky Horror. <laughs> so part of the time I was watching this for this sh- for this for this episode, I was imagining a mashup of Frankenfurter and Wadsworth in this clue mansion setting. <laughs> Oh, I got it right. The top half of the uh, tuxedo yeah. he'd still be wearing, but the bottom half would be the the underwear and the stockings with of the garter course. belts. Yeah, yeah. And, the and he'd be wearing heels. pearls, it, pearls instead of the the bow tie. Right. Yeah. That would be the requirement. But yeah. he would definitely. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. I think he would want the tails from the tuxedo still, so that he could flop that around as he's doing his little strut in the high heels, and or maybe Precise. that's just maybe that's just how I'm picturing it in my head and slightly turned on. I don't know. No, he would well, have that. I'm 100% good with it. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, and he did come in with a, a cane, which, of course, is what you would expect a Frankenfurter entrance. Yes, very much so. I really yeah. like the way that they bring him in and you get to know everything about his character as he first walks on screen because he's handling the dogs. He's doing all of this stuff. And then they bring in the poop smell joke, which, you know, he steps in the dog he- poop. And there, then everybody and there, sniffs it from the rest of the movie on. Yeah, and there are these little slapstick joke t- bits like that, the poop on the shoe thing, when you've introduced all the characters that are just very juvenile slapstick. But in the hands of this group of actors, I feel it's a little bit more elevated <laughs> mm. because they can carry it off like in the perfect comedic timing. Hey, yeah, they, they slum it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Rich. No, no, they're, they're very physical. And, and, you know, it is, I mean, Tim Curry is an amazing physical actor. There's no two ways about it. Absolutely. This no, is the most understated ex- Michael McKean role I've ever seen. Well. Yeah. And Leslie and Warren, I, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't think she gets enough credit for some of her comedic abilities. You know, like between this and Victor Victoria... But yeah, there was another movie. Um, was she in Switch? You guys remember that movie, Switch? Yeah. Was she one of the characters that uh, was I, one of his exes that he was abusive to? Not abusive, but, you know, mistreated? Yeah, I think so. Like she was a married woman or something like that? Or no, no, it was... Um, There was a con man movie where a con man had to make three women propose to him or some shit like that. That's what I'm thinking of. She and she gets, was the married woman. She was going to get a divorce for the guy. I can't remember it, but she was great in that. She gets stuck in a lot of those kind of like things too. But then you're like, oh, wow, you kind of elevated like what your role you have in this semi piece of shit. But she still does interesting things and she has done more. I forget what she was nominated for an Oscar for. Um, but she's, you know what I mean, for best supporting actors. Um, and Christopher Lloyd, my dad was a big fan of Taxi that show and i remember watching that with him as a kid and he was just like loved the reverend jim who was the drugged out track taxi driver who talked like that you know like and it's he always, and Lloyd he, in the, the, every role though isn't it because <laughs> yes. in the what was that movie the dream team with michael mckeon and peter boyle oh and right. stephen he, first he's the one that i think it's he's michael a doctor Mark. Isn't it uh, Michael Keaton that's in yeah, that? Didn't I, didn't I thought I you said Michael Keaton. McKean. Oh. Oh. Michael McKean's in it too? No, 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 I thought I said Michael Keaton. Oh, I'm sorry. I misheard you then. I thought I, maybe my mind filled that in. But yes, Michael that's Keaton. That's what I Dream meant. Team. Yeah. That's what I meant is Michael Keaton. Yeah, no, that's another one of those that, you know, on the, you know, as a child of divorce, it's one of those that I saw in the theater with my dad in the 80s. <laughs> it was the Dream Team. Because my dad liked Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> but, I mean, he was in One Fool with the Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Christopher Lloyd was amazing in that. Um, there's a yeah. lot of really great moments with him. And Danny DeVito as well, which both back to taxi there. Uh, yeah. I, I have usually, I'm so used to Michael and McKean she- being over-the-top type characters to where he's really understated well, well, and quite reserved quite a bit. Christopher Guest movies. Look yeah. at the Christopher Guest movies. Well, I he's mean, the lead Spinal singer Tap of Spinal Tap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, come on, Madeline Kahn. I feel she's understated here. 
I love, I love Metal so Cunt so much. I yeah. do too. I do too. Ugh. I'll watch pretty much anything she's in just because she's in it at this yeah. point. Like, I, I, I'm, if I'm going back to watch Blazing Saddles at this point in my life for the 80 billionth time, it's just yeah. to watch her dance routine in it where she talks about how tired she is. I'm <laughs> tired. <laughs> <laughs> and the little speech that she does that everybody always quotes with her, the flames, flames on the side of my face. Apparently yes. that was all improvised. She just totally went for it. Yeah. And it's awesome. It, which, are we surprised? I mean, you've got, again, like I said, you've just got some really amazing talent who can work well with the script. But there are some people here who really do know how to improvise. So I think that, you know, wait, I think that's, what's great and then you know i don't know you said you were talking about calling camp was that before we started recording yeah i think it's, it's before it's official yeah yeah it's officially friday night in brooklyn the cops are coming yay <laughs> or boo <laughs> not to thankfully not to well i don't know if they're coming to my building yet <laughs> yet <laughs> yeah, yeah don't hold your breath <laughs> yeah is but anyway, I was going to say... Was she in the same police academy as Howard Hessman, uh, a.k.a. the chief? And Yeah, the, I was going to say Howard Hessman is in this from WKRP in Cincinnati. She was um, the class. somebody's... She was somebody's wife in police academy, and she didn't want him to leave to go to the police academy. And then in the next movie, she joins the police academy, and he doesn't want her to be a part of the police force. I remember that much for Colleen Camp. Okay, I can see that scene. Uh, just drive on the hood of the car and stuff. Yep, I believe yeah. that was Colleen Camp for that scene. And then in the next, the next one, it's like she's joining the police academy and her husband doesn't want her to do it for whatever particular reason because he's already a cop. And then she ends up becoming like a pretty integral part of the series from there, I believe. Like she's around for a couple more movies. That's gone by my memory. I haven't seen Police Academy in like forever. You're speaking to someone who I don't even know if I have seen all of the first one. <laughs> oh, it was a rite of passage where I grew up. Everybody mm. had to watch Police Academy movies, apparently. I think the last one I saw was the Miami one, uh, but I hear there are others that had come out after that. Something yeah, Moscow they're all terrible. And something yeah. else. And... Miami's a bit of a stretch to get through as well for me these days. Um, I mostly stick to like the first four. And then I'm kind of done. <laughs> Which one's Tony Hawkins? Is that one or two? Four. Four? <laughs> okay. So, wow, you, you were very quick to answer that. <laughs> that was my Whoa. favorite one when I was a kid because I, I was a skater and I recognized all the guys that were in it. It was like the Bones Brigade and shit. Yeah. I was watching um, Charlie's Angels, the original series, the other day, and, you know, and the Tony Hawk episode popped up. <laughs> Baby was Tony. Baby Tony Hawk. <laughs> Who is not in Clue. <laughs> Who is no. not in Clue. Let's get back but to talking you know, not about Tony Hawk. I mean, you do have two also, awesome musicians. Well, I don't know. At least people. Jane. Jane. Yes. Yay. From the Go-Go's. <laughs> She's the singing, singing telegram. telegram. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Lee Ving. You know, I knew who neither of those people were when I saw this movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think I didn't know Lee Ving was the Lee Ving from Fear when I watched this movie as a kid. But when I saw, um, is it Something Wild or whatever, where he's the cable installer that wrecks that guy's apartment, uh, Eric Stoltz's apartment. I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I recognized him in that when I got older and I'd seen that because I'd started listening to punk around that time. But yeah, going back and watching Clue after you've been exposed to Fear, it's a really weird experience to watch him perform. Because yeah. you're just waiting for him to do something really vile. And then he finally does by like stopping on the guy's foot and poking him in the eyes and punching him. <laughs> he stooges him. And we're yeah. talking about the slapstick and the improv and the vaudevillian sort of stage performance they're putting on in this movie. That would have been cool to see them work it out. They probably have 10 endings that we haven't seen. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I think it's worth pointing out that John Landis was a producer on this and and co-wrote it um, Deborah Hill, directed right? by the guy yep. yeah Deborah Hill was one of the producers and it was directed by the guy who did my cousin Vinny so you know we got we got some 
some talent behind the camera too. I mean, like, you know, so I think that it was just kind of a weird idea that they gambled on because it was a big gamble to release the three different versions, like individually, speaking rather than of, put them all together. Speaking of Deborah Hill, the multiple endings were her idea for marketing purposes. Ah. She came oh. up with that. Yeah. Uh, she, everyone who doesn't know who Deborah Hill is, she is one of the driving forces behind Halloween one and two. And a big part of John Carpenter's life Carpenter, as a producer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. She, Carpenter would not be where he is if it were not for the tireless work of the Hallow Queen that is Deborah Hill. Yeah. I mean. Because women get New York, shit done fog. and they don't get the credit. <laughs> <laughs> so many movies. Women get shit done and don't get the credit. That's why I got to see. You get 89% well, of the credit, right? Uh, or 89 percent less credit or 11 percent less credit we only get 73 percent right i think in the united states these days I so, at least yeah, you can anyway. get a credit card without a husband right there you go and uh, a bank you account get to sign your own credit card you're yeah. so lucky you have your own property you yeah. can own things <laughs> i Not can vote somebody else's on, property i can vote actually Total side note before we go back to the movie Clue, but I just finished this book about called Beyond um, He and She, uh, uh, or What's Your Pronoun, Beyond He and She, and it goes into the history of pronouns and like gender neutral pronouns and that kind of thing, and it's crazy just how it's all been stated, like just based on pronouns, like trying to give women certain rights to do different things. It's, uh, yeah, based on the pronouns that were used in different legal documents. Hmm. I think a lot of the and thou's should have been helping women out a lot more because they're Actually, gender neutral and, and we've been and using those forever. What's interesting is those are general, we've been using gender neutral pronouns like that for hundreds and hundreds of years. Anywho, so you're not PSA infringing on. Day. No. <laughs> I thank yeah. thou for that. He have educated us quite well. Yeah. So you, you recommend the book? I do. It came out earlier this year, and it it's it's written in it's written by a grammarian. So if you are a grammar geek like I am, you'll be excited. But it's also very fascinating examination of just. If you're interested in language and, and just being, you know, evolving with maybe how you might speak uh, uh, pronoun wise with, you know, as regards to gender identity and that kind of thing, I would recommend it. Yeah. But it's it's very fascinating just from a pure linguistic point and, you know, grammatical point of view. I like that you said grammar into, geek instead of grammar Nazi. I don't know. I'm no, I'm just, I go, I'm total geek mode because I go, I might point something out to someone, but there are so many different things that, yeah. But we're, okay. yeah. we're going I know further off the rails. I'm sorry. We're referring, <laughs> going further off topic. Let's go back to clue. Yeah. But yeah. Books, books are made out of wood, uh, b -b cardboard clue. There we go. <laughs> so, okay. I, I put this when I was, I, I have to share this. I have to share this with the listeners. So when I was putting together a group message for all of us trying to arrange a recording, I brought it up that I could bring out my childhood version of Clue, the board game. I mean, I, I from the 70s. I, ha I do literally have it in my closet there. And I would probably kick all your asses. And I played Clue so much when I was a kid. It should have warned my parents that I was going to be into true crime. I'm just saying. <laughs> Same that as but I had to play pretty much with just my sister a lot when I was a kid. Uh. Um, I freaking loved Clue. And that's probably why I got obsessed with true crime. And eventually serial killers, because that's the ultimate of true crime. Because that's such a yeah. weird psychology to follow. 
Uh, and I would blame both the movie clue and the game clue because we played mm-hmm. we played the game because of the movie as kids, which is probably why they oh. made the board game into a movie so that they could get this marketing from it like that. Well, they were very careful with how they set this up in the movie. Um, you know, as far as that, some of the like the the um, different things about are related to the board game. As far as I mean, obviously they're keeping the name, the uh, code names of each of the characters and their colors. Um, it's not necessarily what they're wearing like it is on some versions of the box of the board game, but, um, you know, you have look, their, their cars correspond, like colors correspond the rotation of the rooms that they search or whatever is very much like the board game, like where they're situated and like the floor in that, that hallway when they first come in is like off the, at least the board game version that I have. It's the same one. And there's something else that's a little where, Oh, it starts. They say, they start saying little things like, you know, Miss Scarlet after you. And when you're playing the game clue, Miss Scarlet is the person who goes first, whoever's playing as Miss Scarlet. I do. Like they, they, I have to come clean about something, and it's really important that, okay. that we do this. So, yeah, y- you've all got this like intimate love of of Clue or Cluedo, as it was here. Um, yeah. And for me, um, that game fell into the category along with Monopoly. That it's the game yeah. that always ended it in a fight. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> be, be, because you know, I have a brother, and and I ha- I have a sister as well. But as as children. Um, the rules went out that we know it never ended well, uh, and it usually ended up with, you know what, fuck you, you did it, and I'm going to do this, poof, and that was <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of the game. So, um, I, look, I've learned more about the rules of this game just listening to this podcast than uh, my whole life. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we play we played Clue a lot when I was little. On a family board game night, I don't know who always picked it, but we yeah we we played it a whole lot and yeah I have I have a sister older than me and a sister younger than me. We didn't get into fisticuffs, but we did <laughs> do you know gang up, f- form random alliances and you know do healthy stuff like convince someone that their bedroom is haunted, or so. <laughs> You know. <laughs> oh my god! I am so glad I'm an only child. Can I say that? <laughs> we had a quicksand box when I was a kid. I was an only child eventually. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Stephen Wright joke of all time. Uh, um. <laughs> yeah, I mean he, this this movie. Uh, we, I think. Many of us, I like we talked about learning who Lee Ving was, you know, sometime in high school. Uh, so that was only the millionth time that I had seen the movie by that point. You know, uh, I, I feel like I watch it at least once a year. Uh, it is often quoted in my house, uh, mostly just by Amanda and me. Uh, Danzig doesn't really give much of a shit about it, but he'll still he'll quote big talk. He will in Little China, so I'll let him get away with it. Um, he'll get this thing. Can I guess the quotes that go around in your family, just off the top of my head? Yeah, I've heard you say them whenever we've recorded. Uh, communism was just a red herring. I think it's yes. said a lot around your your domicile. Yes, and um, yes. oh, geez, what's the other one? Uh, long story short, and then someone else saying too late. Too yeah. late. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's uh, double uh, negative, not the communism is a red positive. No meaning. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the no that... meaning. Yes, we do in this house, but we do it from um, uh, the whole 10 yards with uh, Strabo talking to uh, Laszlo. Bogolak. Mm. But occasionally we will do the <laughs> the long story short too late. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I was going to and I was going to ask everyone, what are some of your favorite lines in this because truthfully 
we know there's not much of a plot here. Because <laughs> it was based on a board game. Come on, let's point that out. Even though it is a little bit of a mystery thing. But it's not complex. But there's so much here that's linguistically at play with, like, we were talking about the double negatives and yeah. just he some of that kind of he thing. He threatened to kill me but in public. <laughs> he threatened in public to kill you? Or th- why, why would he yeah, want to kill you in public? I think he means he threatened in public to kill her. Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Exactly. Like one of the all things the different... that one of the things that I love is a combination of the linguistic thing, but then also played with the sort of elevated lowbrow humor of it. It's when they're pulling all of the matchsticks and they're deciding where they're going to go. Um, right before they're going to do that, and uh. Y- Yvette says something about how she'll be too scared to go anywhere in the dark on her own, you know, and would someone go with her? And then the two horny dudes, Colonel Mustard and Professor Plum, both like, yes, I'll go. And then Mr. Green goes, eh, and then just turns around and walks away because he's already confessed <laughs> to being gay. I just love the way that Michael McKean does that, that <laughs> right after everybody's like all like diving in on each other. I just that I don't know why, but that part always makes me laugh. That entire sequence all the way up to when they go to the kitchen and they draw the actual match matchsticks. I just love all of the wordplay and the character interactions because they're already flustered and they're already trying to figure out what's going on. And now at this point, they want to search the house for killers. Yeah. Yeah. See, for me, it, it's a really basic one. And look, it happens in my house on a regular basis. And that, and that is Tim Curry's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're going to do that? Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and of course, if I have to go anywhere... I, I say, and now I'm going to have sex with my wife and just leave. <laughs> I can attest to that. He has actually ended Skype calls on OCD that way. <laughs> well, and I mean, and, um, you know, it, it just, I mean, the Madeline Kahn, you know, the flames up inside of my face. Um, I've done that one, but she also does that whole thing where she does that weird, like pulls in her tongue and it's like, <laughs> that makes a weird sound. I've done that before, and, it, and people are like, "What?" Instead of like blowing a raspberry, it's like the reverse of it. <laughs> no man. Would my be wife has definitely done the flames on the side of my face. Quote at me a I few times. I hated her so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it's. And then the, why is the car stopped? It's frightened. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so stupid, but it just, like, it makes me chuckle every time. You know, and, you know, talking, like, Wadsworth talking with Miss, Mrs. Peacock about the, the blackmail and how she, the, like, sliding the envelopes on a men's room floor. And she's like, or Scarlet says, I would say that stinks. And then Peacock's like, Oh, how would you know? Oh, when boy. were you in that men's room? <laughs> when were you in that men's room? Yeah, th- this is one of those movies just f- full of lines. And a lot of people have a lot of the favorite ones, which is kind of cool. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure somewhere uh, somebody knows every line Yvette said for some reason. Or uh, the the motorist. Maybe maybe there's some somewhere there's a motorist fan club. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's 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 possible. Well, and then you, oh, well, okay, let's. Let, I got to bring up one more. Sorry, Madeline Kahn, Mrs. White line. Husband should be like Kleenex, strong or soft, strong, disposable. <laughs> <laughs> Bev was chuckling many, at all of the Mrs. White stuff this time how around. How many husbands she, have you had? Mine or other women's? <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. The lines that she was going to have to do at dinner when we were watching the movie, she was like really chuckling. I'm like, oh, great. You get to talk about how you want to kill your husband. She's like, he, he, he. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it was the line about, um, no, no, there was the later on part where, one of the things that really made her chuckle is that it's He's just lying after... around. <laughs> yeah, that one made her laugh. Yeah, but the life after marriage one where it's like, now that he's dead, I have a life or something like that. Yeah, now that he's dead, I have a life. <laughs> or life after death. Now that my husband's dead, I have a life. Yeah, that one made yeah, her chuckle exactly. too. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. Everything Madeline Kahn says in this is iconic, it, and you, you'll it'll stick with you. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's I like the, the the other another one that pops up, not so often because nobody really ever calls anybody on anybody else's phone, but. The J. Edgar Hoover. Why is J. Edgar You're going to say right? the same thing I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, you go for it. You say it better. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> like, why? He's on everyone else's. Why shouldn't he be on mine? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which it feeds right into that whole thing that Brink comes out later. Communism's just a red herring. Or what you do actually see earlier in the film with the kitchen and Wadsworth where you've got the McCarthy hearings in the background. Yeah. So things that I mean it's, it's yeah. all that era. 1954, right? Yeah. If you're gonna have any herring represent communism, it might as well be red, right? <laughs> My wife, she had friends who were socialists. <laughs> socialists. <laughs> And I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> I'm a fucking socialist. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that one Not made really. me laugh because nothing has fucking changed in this country after because, that. Look at Miss, Mrs. Peacock's reaction to the dat is just the gasp is just it's so ridiculous. And I know this movie did come out in 1985. It was still the Cold War, but it was at that the end but i remember like i remember where we were still under threat of nuclear war and we were still put like the fear of god was being put into us over the soviet union like in school and like, rocky four <laughs> But I'm talking about, like, just, you know, what was it, like, crazy indoctrination, like, the day after and things like that. You know, those kind of... Red Dawn, come on, Wolverine! Red Dawn, yeah, well. <laughs> All it takes is a high school football kid from the middle of nowhere in America to take on the entirety of the Red Army and kick his ass. That's exactly... Shaw, that's, that's what I gotta say. Zora, decide where you're sitting, please. <laughs> That whole thing is so culturally American. We don't understand any of that shit at all. (laughs) That's why we're septos. Yeah. No. See, Ronald Reagan was sworn into office in 1981. And then he put on a show. Uh, Ronnie. Yeah. I think when this movie came out, Bonzo had not yet been to Bitburg. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Now I have that song stuck in my head. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't complaining. I like Bonzo Goes to Bitburg. I figured it was a serious thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. not Johnny Ramone. I don't hate that song and made him change the lyrics completely to a different song. <laughs> There's like three punks that are going to listen to this and be like giggling along with us, Darren. Everybody else is like, shut the fuck up, you. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> get, let's get back to I'm Clue. giggling. I'm giggling and... and... God well, damn it. Okay, I'm one since... of the people around here that rules the roost. No, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> since we're talking about lines in the movie and yeah. it's already lines. been made a little bit political. And mm-hmm. you said that this was written by the person that wrote My Cousin Vinny. Yep. What line from Clue would Rudy Giuliani say <laughs> at a hearing in Michigan? Or wherever the fuck he's tried to quote my cousin Vinny. I don't know, but I have his hair dye over here. At least a better one. <laughs> the, the no run version? The Zorg? I know how to take care of that shit. <laughs> Leave it to me. I'll take care of that shit. But oh my god. Um I think I he would be know. doing the Kingdom the Kingdom of Heaven rant that uh the guy yeah. from WKRP in Cincinnati does when he's first introduced. I yeah, think he would just be doing that in court, that trying Hes- to get a win. That um, that Howard Hessman does. Yeah, mm. yeah. I couldn't think of the actor's name, Howard Hessman. Yeah. Also on head of the class. <laughs> I'm sure I saw head of the class before I got to sneak and see WKRP in Cincinnati. 
Oh man, I love day. My dad loved day, WKRP. Um, so I, yeah, I saw that as a kid too. I've watched them both on reruns and I was aware of them as a kid, but I haven't seen head of the class since I was a kid, but I remember really digging the reruns of that and wishing I could have caught it in syndication as is. Um, yeah, I think I, WKRP was off the air by the time I was allowed to watch TV. Uh, but I live in Ohio, so it was just, you, you, turn on a channel and there's a chance that there's <laughs> WKRP in the eighties and early nineties. Just that's a valid point. Having lived in Cincinnati, <laughs> yeah. but that was, a, I was there in the nineties. So it's like the Drew Carey show. Now it's going to be all over Ohio, no matter what. Yep. <laughs> More so in the Cleveland Akron area. Yeah. Yeah. I could totally see that. I remember WKRP being on all the freaking time. So that's kind of how I, I had caught it, you know, and it just was one of those ones where if it was on the father would always make sure that it would not change from that. Cause he always enjoyed it. And speaking. Okay. And speaking of Howard Hessman, his character on there, Johnny fever was the same kind of, or a similar, slightly druggy guy as what, Christopher Lloyd played on Taxi because there was like I rem- distinctly remember seeing this with my dad as I when I was a kid watching Howard Hessman and he was freaking out he was having a drug freak out on like on air on uh the character was on the episode of WKRP in Cincinnati uh, <laughs> yeah every every november the i swear to god i thought turkeys could fly episode <laughs> oh my god that that is the best thing ever i have to watch at least that scene every thanksgiving yes yes yeah yeah anywho again we're getting sidetracked we're talking but, about an actor uh, in the movie at least we are we are and this is like, I feel like this is just a whole era of nostalgia, too, because so many of these actors are from a specific era. Not that they haven't been working. I mean, some of them at least have continued working in different capacities. But, you know, this was much more, I guess, their heyday. I believe that Tim Curry only stopped working because of his health, because he was acting in just about anything anyone would have him in and acting his fucking heart out. Uh, Michael McKean, most recently, in Better Call Saul, where he plays Chuck, some of the finest acting work I've ever seen anyone do, let alone a comedian, that this is not their normal thing. But that's the thing about comedians is when it's time to get real, they can get real so much more uncomfortably than other people because they have to analyze that kind of stuff with how life works in order to try and take the pain and turn it into humor. And when they're not turning it into humor and just showing you the pain, they're so very much aware of it. And I I think that's very evident with the, with Michael McKean in that show as, as Chuck and better call Saul. No, I I think that's a very valid point because I mean, I was going to bring up Robin Williams, for instance, look at his dramatic work and so many, and then look at his personal life and so many other comedic actors or stand-up comedians and where they've had their, their own personal demons. And they their comedy is a way to either push it to the side or to deal with it, like to process it, like their demons that they have. And when they are allowed to have a dramatic role, like even Bill Murray, once he started getting some more dramatic roles... I, they can get some of those demons out. You know, I think in a, I think in a and lot of cases, they're not doing too. just self-destruct like a Chris Farley or, you know, Jim Belushi, I don't think was allowed enough dramatic opportunities either. I think in a lot of cases too, the thing that drives someone to become a comedian is that need for external validation. Cause you're not finding that validation within. You can't accept yourself for who you are. And part of that pain is, if I can just make people laugh, that's what makes a class clown. And then when a class clown ends up doing that for a living, that need to just feel like someone will, you know, they'll like you if you can make them laugh just increases ever more so. And so when you get a chance to drop that veil and kind of deal with what you're dealing with and show those kinds of emotions and actually act and you, you get the chance, 
I think that's why a lot of comedians do jump into the dramatic acting and do an amazing job. I mean, let's look like Greg Kinnear. I mean, that guy hosted the fucking soup and look at some of the dramatic work he can do. <laughs> no, that's no, that's true. That's true. I mean, and also, I mean, even Tom Hanks, come on. Look <laughs> where he how he evolved. Yeah, he started with bosom buddies and now he's one of the finest uh dramatic actors that we have known more for dramatic stuff i mean he's you know he's won multiple oscars yeah the saying. united states government has no more credibility so they're going to rent some of his yeah i mean i was going to say I, not to, he shouldn't have necessarily won too but that's beside the point um yeah yeah, but still, it's yeah. You get these actors stack like and and like I said, you get someone like Madeline Kahn in here who can be so much more, and we have seen her be so much more. And for instance, like Mel Brooks movies, she seems almost understated here, even though they're still slapstick, you know, borderline slapstick moments she's doing. It's still not the level of like Mel Brooks. She's almost a straight man character, like the Lou Abbott to a Costello, just letting Costello go off. And then Abbott just sits there and absorbs it and then reacts to it. That's almost the role that she's doing here. And that's, I mean, for a lot of comedians, at least in my personal experience, it's kind of hard to be able to do both. You can either play the straight man or you can be the wild card type character that, you know, the straight man has to deal off of. And to switch back and forth, because Madeline Kahn, for most of her career, especially in Mel Brooks stuff, she's usually the wild card, right? I mean, just right. look at young Frankenstein. She does not leave scenery behind in everything that she's in. She just chews it up with the way that she's, you know, just commanding every moment of the screen. But in here, she sits back and she uses herself as like a springboard for jokes for the other cast members for a lot of cases. And she does a lot of the more dry delivery wit. But she does it so masterfully that I would have loved to have seen her be the straight man in these comedy bits a lot more than just this film. Well, and this is such an ensemble film. I mean, much more so than and I keep bringing up Mel Brooks when I'm talking about Madeline Kahn. But even though I mean, Mel Brooks did have like a stable of actors that he was regularly kind of working with for a while. And that did include Madeline Kahn. And it it's just that I feel like not she wasn't given enough opportunities in her career overall with, you know, other directors, too. But that's one of those reasons when I mean, she, she was one of those like celebrity deaths that I mean, when she passed away, I, I, you know, I did shed a little tear because I was just like, oh, my God, you're taken too young and you're such an amazing talent. And, you know, and she also, by all accounts, like, you know, very philanthropic and just a good person, too, uh, <laughs> which sucks even more. <laughs> yeah. As, since we're doing some Madeline Kahn love and it is our not quite Christmas episode. Everybody oh, going to yeah. watch Mixed Nuts this month? I like that movie. I'm not a big holiday movie person, but I feel that movie's a little underrated. I think she's a little bit more of the sort of a combination. She's she's a serious character for the most part in that, but she's pretty funny. Yeah. You know, I, I think I saw that available somewhere on streaming, and I think I need to actually check it out because, I one, I'm on a Christmas movie kick, as I mentioned at the intro. Yeah. And two, I just looked it up, Madeline Kahn and Steve Martin. God, why have I not seen this yet? I've never actually watched I, it, so I need to give oh, it a you shot. you haven't? No, it's I'm Mad shocked. Madeline Kahn, Steve Martin, Rita Wilson, Anthony Juliette LaPaglia. Lewis, Anthony LaPaglia in drag. Um, or that, that Robert Schreiber. Klein. Um, who else is in it? It's just got a really great cast and... It's it's just kind of fucking just silly. It's it, yeah, and I I think oh, it's, it's based it, no, off of no, French it, comedy. No, 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 I'm I'm sorry. Anthony Lapagli is in it. Leah Schreiber is in drag. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I don't either. Think either way, I'm into it. Whoever's in drag, there, I'm into it. The character is trans. We won't spoil any more of it. I think you should totally check yeah. out this movie. Oh yeah, I'm it's, definitely going to probably right after place. I'm done recording. 
It takes place Christmas at a suicide hotline. In Venice. <laughs> in, in Venice Beach. Wow, that sounds fantastic. In Venice Beach, California. Yeah, I gotta I gotta I gotta check it out. I'm gonna probably try and sell it to the wife to watch right after we're done here. <laughs> and I think oh, oh, who else is who else appears in it? Gary Shandling, name? right? Gary Shandling, thank you. Uh he's the landlord. I just so that's your holiday movie recommendation. If you love Clue, check out Mixed Nuts next. It's yes, a good exactly. ensemble movie, too. Um, good, yep, good ensemble. Has, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it it has, it's a little, it's kind of, it's a nice dark comedy. Yeah. So I recommend Clue and Mixed Nuts. How, how's everybody else doing? I think we are near the end of this episode. Well, I was going to, I was going to, before we get to the end, I had, I had a couple questions so if you're looking in this big mansion say we all had this space what was the favorite room of this mansion like, or the library rooms, or rooms you can have two yeah that library oh my god and that the foyer a- those are my two favorite though the foyer where it's the big opening with all of the victorian style woodwork over everything mm-hmm. it's so gorgeous and the library, I just love the fact that the doors also have shelves for books, which is I my dream. bought the same thing. <laughs> kind of figured we would be a bit kismet on that. <laughs> the, the fake door where you could just seal yourself in the room full of books. Uh, just, yeah, definitely that's the way to go. <laughs> However, I would also have to go as a secondary. Either the study... Or the billiard room as a secondary one because both have a nice bar set up. <laughs> and it is a nice big kitchen. Full credit. It's a beautiful and, and big kitchen. It is a big kitchen. But also that study, I'm going to go back. My secondary one is the study because it's a nice little like cocktail set up. But it has also more bookshelves. <laughs> Vanessa's two passions, drinking and reading. They are. <laughs> they are. If the dogs were nice, I'd like the room where I could... Uh, play with the, the solarium or the conservatory no is that the conservatory that's outside um, the solar i i forget how it is in clue because there is a, also a 1980s board game came out that called haunted mansion and it was a, a ripoff on clue that and i had that too <laughs> was that a murder mystery too yeah or, okay it was i don't know if i remember that game but it had a, I can't remember, it It had a one, I think it might have been bigger and had more rooms. So it had a conservatory, a conservatory and a solarium. Yeah. Because they got to do Clue one better by at least adding two of the same kind of rooms, but are slightly people different. houses, you know, something I'm never going to have. You know, <laughs> don't ask me. Like the line in uh, Ready or Not when, when he's like, yeah, everyone's meeting in the music room and uh, Samara Weaving responds with, yes, a totally normal room that one should have in their house. <laughs> so one more thing that I do have to mention, you know, so of course at the end, because it's the 80s, they have to do in ending number two, the whole little thing. This is Peacock's a man. You know, where it's a play on words, but it's also like a bad, like transphobic kind of joke. (laughs) And then you've got in version three, you have to have the little kind of homophobic thing there too. Calling out Mr. Green and or what he said that, you know, that he was gay and so it's i'm like those don't need to be there as far as the humor but i feel like that was such a part of shit that was written into 80 scripts yeah i think it was just the perception of <laughs> being able to make those jokes and you know what's and the get, what's the real get away with it what's the harm because they didn't realize they're actually punching down at human beings right well, right i know because there's some there's some racial insensitivity stuff that's involved a little bit in some of the joking too. 
Um, I can't remember specifically where it is, but there was a couple of moments no. that watching it through the lens of my more quote unquote woke eyes, if I've, as I've been told they are, it makes me cringe. <laughs> well, no, the, it seems a little, yeah, there's a little, yeah, no, I agree. But, and that's the only thing is that, you know, but it, it's just like, you've got those two glaring little things where you're like, really? What did that add to anything? What? Why? Well, the ones that I particularly don't like, focusing in on the fact that Michael McCain's character is supposed to be gay, Mr. Green is supposed to be gay. When the police come rushing in in one of the endings, he cowers in fear Mm -hmm. and huddles down. And he's supposed to be an FBI agent. So the only reason they had him do that is because he's gay. So he has to be a hysterical female for a moment. Like that kind of that kind of stereotype. I. I didn't notice that until I watched it for this review and it really bugged me this time. I'm like, just because he's gay doesn't mean he's going to do that. He's an FBI well, agent. If anything, he should be trying to take control of the situation. Yeah. Well, no, in that one, he wasn't an FBI agent in that ending when he's cowering down like that. That's the ending with what Miss Scarlet or Mrs. Peacock. But doesn't he say like that? Doesn't he say earlier on that he's, he works in, the FBI or some type of intelligence or uh, something State like that. Department. Oh, he just says State Department. He just says, yeah. he just says State Department. Okay. No. Never mind then. Yeah, I, yeah. I withdraw. But still, like, just because he's gay, he has to act like that. It still bugs me. I just was under the presumption well, that he's been the FBI the whole time. No, but, but let me say, if the, we've already set up, I mean, they don't have to necessarily make him more if that's perceivably feminine. But what I would point out is that at this time, Hoover specifically had these operations where they were going after gay people in the State Department. And so it would be like a raid where he would be terrified, maybe. Well, he said he would lose his job. He could lose his job. Like, I mean, he could lose housing. I mean, you could still do that in certain parts of the country now, certain parts of the world, but it's not like it, I mean, it was, but who is just, oh my God, it was bad. It was bad. You know, I have a friend, I'm just saying, I have friends who were kicked out of the military in the 80s, early 90s because they were gay. Because of witch hunts that were going on in the government. And it was ten times worse then. That might have been an appropriate response. Even if you weren't gay. (laughs) Just that, holy shit, it's a raid. I didn't do anything. Why are you here? They're going to shoot everybody. Get down, get down. It's the the cops. They're most likely to beat everyone to death. And then go, he did it. Um, So, yeah, look, carrying when the cops turn up, probably a smart move. All right. Yeah, sorry. It just, that's what I was, like, it just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of bugged me because I felt like they were doing the stereotypical Harris, like, you know, hysterical gay guy that's terrified of everything just because he was gay. But he keeps getting more and more terrified. But I guess if he's in the State Department, all of this stuff is going to be the end of his career regardless, beyond the fact that he's gay. All of all of the things that are happening in this evening are going to ruin his career and obviously him being terrified by it. It's a nice perspective that I wasn't thinking of. But, Court, to your point, how he has been set, how the character has been set up through the entire film, if he is actually gay, as versions one and two of the ending would have us believe, then he, that can be attributed, that can be, the klutziness can be attributed to that as someone who was not a suave and that, you know, it's, it's gay people or that, are, you know, a gay man is in this category because it's only a straight, you know, cis man who knows how to be this certain way and how to act this certain way, particularly around women or something. I, you know, it, you could carry it further in what you're saying in the portrayal of he's not the most smooth person overall you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. That's, 
Yeah, the just some of the ways that it was handled definitely with my more quote unquote woke eyes now. I found it bothered me a lot more than watching it as a kid or years and years ago. And I watched right. this even before I knew for sure I was doing it on the show. I watched this as part of my 300 movies I watched for Halloween. So this was one of them that I picked. And I tend to watch it more towards that time frame of Halloween because I always think of it more as like a Halloween kind of fun romp film to watch. But uh, it really works for Christmas, too. Like, I really enjoyed watching it, thinking of it as being Christmas time that they're setting this all up. This, I, it's funny. I watch this a lot during the fall. Definitely. I watch I it a the, lot during the fall. The stormy sort of rainy weather that they're having mm-hmm. while they're at the house, it really helps for that. And murder mysteries really take place best in the fall when the rest of the world is starting to die out and get cold yeah. anyway. It yeah. just works for the atmosphere. Yeah. So, Darren, you have anything else to say? No, uh, I, I know I know you got to go, Court. So I, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everybody for their time. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Vanessa. I got enough time to do the full wrap up and everything, so that's oh, fine. Cool. Well, I still want to thank you. I don't take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to thank my very very lovely wife, just in case she listens to the whole of the episode and not just how the play part that she took part in for the dinner scene is I'd like to thank her very much for taking time out of her very busy schedule to show up and have a little fun with all of us. That was a total blast. And I hope a treat for her as well. Yes. Thank you again. We, we really appreciated that. We, we had actually been trying to get at least a scene from this together for a while. And we were trying to do it with as many people as possible and we started realizing scheduling wise uh, gets a little complicated. And and I wanted to and I picked a scene that I was like that would be interesting with back and forth because it's also you can't really this is a hard movie to find a scene, you know, that's interesting and long enough that's more than just two people. <laughs> but it plays well to a group. And um, so, yes, thank you very much, Bev. We appreciate appreciate your help. Um, how you put up with court, we're not sure. Um. <laughs> A whole lot of patience. I freely admit it because I've said it before on the air and I'll say it again. I'm like that annoying dog that follows Spike around in the Looney Tunes. Like, what are we doing now? What are we doing now? Like constantly needing external validation, which is why I'm so aware of that for comedians. Because <laughs> I've, I've tried and failed at it <laughs> to, to get that external validation. Which, so you have any last thoughts on this movie? No, Madeline Kahn. The Madeline Kahn. <laughs> Madeline yes. Kahn. That's, your, that's it. <laughs> that, that, that's it. If, if nothing else, you walk away from this movie after watching it, Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn. Done. Mom. I would have liked to take both her and Leslie Warren's character to dinner right after this movie if I were single. <laughs> yeah. That would be a nice dinner. I, w- I would I would pay and I would tip at least 20%. <laughs> That's good to know. The dining staff, not Leslie Warren's character. Come on, everybody. Yes. No, I actually understood that. <laughs> Having but said also, that, there's nothing wrong with tipping your sex workers, people. Uh, no, 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 actually, you should. I, I highly encourage you tip your sex workers. Yes. 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 So, so, um, Court, would you like to tell us about your podcast and where to find it? Yeah. Cinema Psyops, uh, same network as this show. Uh, main landing and launching page, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. Not exactly sure how many episodes we're going to be at uh, when the time that this actually comes out, but. We're currently, as of this recording, at 278 and rolling of consecutive weeks of releases through thick and thin tragedy and pandemics and uh, personal crises, meltdowns, falling outs, fisticuffs. Matt and I still keep doing it all this freaking time because it's the show and it must go on and we both need it for the external validation. <laughs> <laughs> At least we did it. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, on Facebook. You can find me there. Court Psyops. That's the name I go by. Uh, Matt's also there, but as Darren will attest, it's very hard to get a response out of him if you try to message him. Only four months. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> only only four months. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, Facebook groups, Twitter, on um, that court underscore underscore sci up there. And then Cinema Psyops, you can find us on Instagram as uh, at underscore or at cinema underscore psyops there as well. Um, that's how you find me if you, for whatever reason, haven't heard my show before and didn't think I'm a complete twat and you still want to listen to more of me. That's how you find me. Okay. And which would you like to tell people how to find you and your shows? You can find me in the cupboard. Just, you know, those eyes that are peeking through the slot. That's me. Um, once you've done that and gone back to watching podcasts, uh, you can find me on the same network as Court and this fabulous show, along with the host's other shows. Um, by the time you hear this, we'll probably be up to the penultimate or even the ultimate episode of Witch versus the Doomsday Clock, uh, rapidly reaching 100 and shutting it all down, which is exciting and a little sad and a whole lot of other stuff. And But all of you have been on the show, and I thank you personally for that. Um, yeah. Station. It's been very exciting. Station. <laughs> and uh, my other show which is uh, moving along slowly uh which is gangs of hollywood podcast also on legion but it also has its own website www.gohpod.com you can find me on twitter and facebook uh for goh pod just look for goh pod uh for which versus Doom- doomsday clock and or me search for w-y-c-h i will be there doing stuff that's what i do <laughs> okay sounds like a plan okay um well you know what darren and i are going to let the two of you go and we will take a short break um okay okay well i'm gonna go have sex with my wife <laughs> take him away chief <laughs> thank you both for being here um always always a pleasure always a pleasure it was wunderbar. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, not sorry. <laughs> okay, and we are back to wrap up the show very quickly. Um, you know, because we always have to get our shit together these days. It, I'm telling you, I do not know what COVID has done to scramble my brain and my sense of time where I can't properly plan out a calendar. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is with me these days. It's, I just have no sense of time anymore because I'm not going into the office like regular. Anyway, that's... <sighs> Probably a story for my, you know, for a therapist. But anyway, so figured out what we're doing for January. Yeah, our next episode for January, we're going to get back to a little reading. However, um, nothing heavy, heavy, heavy duty. I mean, I know it's still Darren. You've got your reading time cut back. We are going to be covering the comic slash graphic novel, uh, whichever you want to call it, Bitch Planet by Kelly Sue uh, DeConnick and uh, Valentine DeLandro. And you were talking off mic about the future and about sci-fi and that's what this is it is more dystopian future um but kind of a feminist portrayal of exploitation genre yeah so gonna be doing that and the movie (laughs) Actually, we mentioned earlier on this episode that, coincidentally, I had been thinking about um, for something else. The movie Johnny Mnemonic with Keanu Reeves (laughs) and (laughs) Ice-T and Udo Kier. (laughs) Wow, I haven't seen. See, I'm finding out with everybody else. I haven't seen that yeah. movie in so long. Is Bitch Planet one of the comics you sent me? 
I sent you volume two of it. Okay, we will be doing volume one, I assume, unless it's... We're going to be doing volume one. We're going to be doing volume one because I... Yes, you're correct, Darren. I did send you volume two first, and it's funny. I read volume two before I read volume one of it. And this is a case where I actually went and picked up comics or graphic novels on my own. And we know how I don't necessarily do that so much. But um, I think you'll find the artwork interesting. And I think you'll find the story interesting. Yeah. Cool. I, yeah. I flipped through it, but I did notice that it was volume two. So I didn't mm-hmm. start reading it, but I put it on my it, shelf with other wonderful graphic novels like, you know, mm-hmm. Mouse and Safe Area Garajda or what it, when you yeah, were talking I, about Dystopia and Bitch Planet before you told me anything about it. I was like, hopefully it's like a feminist version of Why the Last Man written by a woman. I don't know if you ever read um, why, why the Last Man. No, I don't think I have. It was well, it's written by a guy, and it's been a long time mm-hmm. since I've read it, and I have I didn't read it with uh, this sort of criticism in mind. Right, but it's, it's a comic book written by a guy about all the men, everybody with a Y chromosome except for him and his monkey. Like he was training a monkey to learn sign language or something like that. Yay. They're the only two males left alone on the planet. There's actually going to be a series on FX, I guess. Finally, they've All been talking I gotta say about is, yay monkeys with jobs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's like uh, you know women as women do just mm-hmm. sort of adapted, and they they have the world now. But he's the only man, right? Uh, so. Uh, it was that one was by uh, written by Jace. I think it was Jason Youngbluth. But uh, anyway, sorry. I think that's the same writer that did that Weapon Brown comic book that I talk about. That's like post apocalyptic, mm-hmm. funny papers. But anyway, sorry, Bitch Planet. That's okay. Who did you say that was written by? Or I, I mean, I can oh. look, I can look on volume two. I guess. Sorry, I just. I just pulled it back. Let me bring that back up. It's Kelly C. Kelly Sue De McConnick and Valentine De Leandro or De Landro. Sorry, sorry, I miss I misspoke there. No problem. Man, I have not seen Johnny Demonic in so long. I haven't either, and I remember seeing that in the theater, and I'll tell you about my reaction to it when we have that episode. (laughs) Cool. It it was one of the funnier reactions I've had in 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 a film. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it, and I hope everybody else does, too. Uh, So you've got about a month-ish to read the comic if you want to. I think we'll probably, since they're not not based on the same material, we can separate it a little bit better. Yeah, and it's not very long. You know, it's it's a it it goes fairly quickly. Um, you know they're. I think maybe a hundred pages, but there there's a lot of the book that is artwork with no dialogue. Cool. Um, all right. Oh we... no! Now the now, now the neighbors are starting to get excited. So <laughs> I guess that does mean it's time to wrap this up before my next door neighbor's party gets really cranked up. Coming up on a maybe line. I'll go over there and join them. Maybe I'll go join them. <laughs> Six feet apart. It sounds like it's probably 
just it's at most three people but probably more like two <laughs> and they've just got loud music Now, turn up the music wherever you are. We have yeah. been the VD Clinic podcast. Wishing you a... Oh, another... Oh, thank you for listening to us to throughout 2020 and this crazy fucked up year. <laughs> Yeah, it's. <laughs> Let's all make it into it. Let's all hope the next one is better. Jesus fucking Christ on a rubber cross. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't it's say it better just... myself. Uh, <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye. Lots of work. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that. I was waiting for you to go. And here we go into yes. VD Clinic Theatre. Sorry. Uh, and uh, there was no VD Clinic Theatre. So... No, 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 the, no, because that's where we put our little music for quarantine theatre. Oh, I know, but I, I was waiting for you to do it, but now I feel like a dumbass, so it's too it's fucking okay. late. It's so, okay. Bollocks, Let's do it bollocks, live. Bollocks. <laughs> do it live. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more. <laughs>